Hi everyone, welcome to the second platform workshop. Today we'll be going into API building and specifically how we can do this with the Flask framework. So first we will discuss APIs and REST. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And essentially this is a software intermediary that allows two applications to talk to each other. Um, an API lists operations that the developer can use and tells them what they can do. Um, and then the developer or the user of the API can then call each of these functions or methods uh, to get the desired operation or behavior done. Um, it, in some ways, this is similar to object-oriented programming concepts where we want to abstract away the implementation details. So we only care about what the operation is and how to use or and how to call a method to get the operation to give me back a um, desired result. Um, APIs in the way that we will use them um, are used to communicate between services um, and to manipulate update or um, retrieve or even delete data. And they're used commonly throughout um, web development in general. Um, an analogy for an API, um, I mean, there, there are many of them, but one good one is a, a car's dashboard. So when you're driving a car um, or in the front seat, you can uh, you know, press buttons, turn knobs, and these will perform operations for you. Uh, or even think about the steering wheel. You can, you can steer um, or move the steering wheel and uh, the car turns. You don't need to know exactly how this is done. Um, you don't need to know like the specific physics, the mechanics uh, of how this is working, but you just know the desired uh, result and what you need to do to, to get that um, result. Turn the knobs, turn the steering wheel, um, and, and also, um, again, kind of corresponding to APIs, you can press certain buttons to display information. Um, and this is kind of like how an API uh, can give you data uh, from a resource or service, or it can perform an operation for you. And on the right, I have some examples of common APIs. So most kind of um, platforms or websites or any kind of application that you use will probably have an API that will allow developers to tap into it. Um, for example, Google Places API, Twitter API, you can use these APIs to you know, get information easily as a developer uh, from these services. Um, and they potentially may be useful um, as you work on your project. So we have covered APIs and what they are, um, but you may have also heard of the term REST um, and heard of the term REST APIs. So REST essentially stands for Representational State Transfer, and it's essentially an architectural style for providing standards between computer systems uh, and how they interact on the web. Um, the REST architecture is pretty simple. Uh, it's a simple kind of client server architecture where the client will send a specific type of request. Uh, we'll go into these requests uh, in the next slide. But so the client will send these requests to the server. Um, the server will take these requests, uh, perform some computations on them, look up some data from a database that they have access to, and form a response to this request, which they'll send back to the client. This response is usually in the form of a JSON uh, or XML file or format. Um, and there are a couple of conditions to be considered restful. Um, some of them are more technical and not really worth going into, but the main con the main conditions are that it's the communication between client and server is stateless. Uh, this means that no client information is stored between get requests and that each request is separate and unconnected. This really re uh, increases simplicity and reduces complexity of any kind of system so that no state has to be, you know, kept and logged and, and maintained and looked up between when processing a request. Um, obviously, this ha there's good and bad to this, but um, this just completely um, removes any complexity. However, there is uh, data is cached to streamline requests. Uh, specifically, this means that on the, on the server side, if say there were a lot of requests for some resource uh, or some information, that information may be cached. 
such that it can be easily returned back to the uh, multiple clients that request it um, in a much quicker manner. Uh, and finally, usually these interfaces are uniform. So this means that essentially they're consistent throughout in in messages, um, what they return, etc. So, for example, like all of these like uh, four 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 uh, me uh, codes and and messages that that you get when say a service is offline or like a two hundred, um, these are all self descriptive and consistent requests. Um, things that you can you know look up and and they're also uniform. Um, also, the data format is uniform. Uniform. So when you make a request, say the same resource five times, um, you'll get the same uh, response back. And this kind of goes into also how to maintain APIs. Usually you never want to change how data is actually returned back to the user. Uh, even if you change the internals of how this computation is happening to maybe you know, make it more efficient or something, you never want to change how data is coming back to the, the, the user um, or even how multiple requests or multiple different API calls, maybe all of them uh, should return data in this in a similar type of way. So this helps the developer you know, easily be able to uh, parse this data that they get back as we discussed in the last lecture uh, and use it in their own applications. So now we will go into some of the specific requests that we mentioned on the previous slide. Um, really most of these requests are self-descriptive in name, um, but there's some slight nuances. So we will go into them. Um, first, we have the get. So the, the get request um, essentially tries to get a representation of a specific resource. In kind of layman's terms, um, it just gets data that you want um, from a server database. The post request is somewhat the opposite. So it's used to submit or post an entity uh, to a specific resource. So, so to change data uh, in a resource or to create a new resource altogether. Uh, and does change the state um, on the server or in the database. So it has side effects. So this is kind of like if you allow a user to have a post request or make a post request, they could potentially completely mess up your server. Um, so you need to be very careful with having post requests. Whereas get requests are mostly benign. I mean, there's some privacy issues potentially, but there is nothing that would allow a user to um, you know, change something or delete uh, lots of things. Uh, put is very much like post. Um, however, it is idempotent, is what we call idempotent. So this means that calling the same put request multiple times will always produce the same result. Uh, so you should have to change uh, this, like change the name, uh, the name field, for example, if you have a username. If you keep repeating the same request of changing this name, it will just, you know, change it once and then kind of the uh, resulting entry will be the same. But for a post request may create new resources or do something different um, every time. So that's a slight kind of difference between put and post. Uh, delete just simply deletes the specific resource um, data. So now we'll just briefly discuss Flask um, and how it works. So Flask is a Python micro web framework, uh, and it provides you with all the tools, libraries, technologies, uh, and anything else you really need to build a web application um, and APIs. And by web application, I mean the back end of the web application. Obviously, you'll have to use different technologies to build the front end. Um, but here, we really care about APIs and the back end kind of um, work. Uh, and one of the great aspects of it is that it's extremely lightweight, um, and it's extremely easy to just get in, get started uh, using uh, without having to, you know, install a lot of things and import a lot of things. Um, so now we'll go into a quick demo using Flask uh, and we can see how we can build an API. Hi, so now we'll go into a quick walkthrough, uh, code walkthrough and demo of using a Flask um, API and building a Flask API. So I, um, you would probably be able to get this code, uh, probably send it out. Um, you can uh, download it and play along with it um, with this video. I think during the actual physical uh, workshop in person, we will probably manipulate this and have an exercise like that. So it'll be useful if you have this downloaded before, um, before the workshop ahead of time. 
Um, so first, um, once you've downloaded everything, I'm just in VS Code. Um, you should see all of these files, uh, description, database file, requirements file, and test file. Um, and the first thing to do is to make sure you have Python installed. Um, and you know, we'll need Python, especially for your projects, um, but even during these um, workshops. So make sure that you have it installed, preferably something above 3.6, try to get the, you know, high send version. I think it's 3.10 at this point. Um, so definitely install Python, potentially use a Conda environment um, if, you, if you want. Um, I think it's easier that way. Um, so the first thing is uh, we need to install dependencies. So all these dependencies are in the requirements of text file. Um, and so you just open a terminal in the right directory. Uh, actually, for this, it doesn't really matter where you are, but um, you want to just install uh, from this requirements file. So that's where you use the R. Um, so we just install all of these uh, dependencies. I've already installed all of them. So um, we're good there. Um, and now, so before going into the code and how it works, um, essentially, let me just describe uh, how what this specific API is and just perform some um, requests. So this is a uh, an API that um, you know I've taken from uh, another source that essentially allows you to. Um, manipulate or stores and allows you to access manipulate video records so specifically I mean just from this line you can kind of see we care about uh, the video name the number of views it has and the number of likes it has and all the manipulations are done in this way um, to manipulate or to get these three kind of values um, so um, and and um, additionally, every video has an ID that's used to identify it, um, although it's not really important in terms of what the user sees. Um, so now we can uh, start using this API. So first what we need to do is actually start running the Flask server. Um, so what we do here is, uh, actually let me clear. Um, so what we do is we simply need to um, Sorry, we just need to run main.py because that's where our code is um, for the server. Um, if you see some warnings, that's okay. Um, but you see that the server has started up. Uh, and this is in debug mode. So the nice thing about this is whenever you make a change um, and save it, it will just automatically uh, uh, refresh the server with the new changes. So that's a nice feature. Uh, so then we want to open another terminal window. Um, and now, if you go into test.py, you'll see a test. So essentially what this is doing is actually just formulating this request. Um, so the base, this is, if you don't know, this is kind of the local host um, IP. And then we're on port 5000, um, which is the port that actually, if you check, um, yep, this is the port that the, the server is running on. So, then we need to append all of our um, API requests um, information. So we're requesting the video API um, two, and again, if you look here, the ID is two. This is where this comes from. So actually, if you go down here, actually this is better. Um, so we we have added the, the uh, resource again. I'll go into this, but um, video and then the video ID. So we specify the video ID. Um, which is two here, and then we specify some um, information. And specifically here, we're patching, um, patching, which is another um, means of saying that we're updating. Um, it's another one of these requests. So, um, or specifically, this is like kind of if some data is missing, we want to plug that in that data. Um, so this is what we can do with patch uh, if you don't have all the data. So, um, yeah, actually, yes. Okay. Um, so we next, um, so this is the form request and then we just call requests, which we've, uh, it's a library that allows you to do submit requests. Um, and we call the patch method, um, with this, um, query 
and we get the response and we just print out the JSON. Um, so we can do that by opening up another terminal um, and just in Python and then test pi. Uh, and we see that we have some output response. So we've changed the name to Tim uh, and the views to 100,000. Actually, let me just change these because these may have been the default. Um, so we change this to save, change it to Jim and 9,000. And again, we see that it's updated in the database. I print it back to us. Uh, and we'll see now, we're going to now go into how this works. Okay, so when using Flask, we first need to import a few things. So we import Flask and Flask RESTful, and Flask RESTful comes with a lot of stuff to uh, specifically for REST APIs. So all this like resources, fields, and, and things we'll go into. Uh, then we need to initialize the Flask app. So these two lines are standard in any Flask app you'll really see. Um, so just things to remember and keep in mind. And, and obviously you can look up documentation as you go along. Next, we initialize the database. Um, again, we haven't really gone into databases, so this is a really simple kind of database introduction um, and, and, and usage. Uh, we'll go into databases and GCP and other things in a future video, uh, future workshop. Um, but essentially, a database just stores data and allows you to query it and, and, and change it. Um, so we are using um, SQL Alchemy, um, which is a very simple, easy to use kind of database format. Uh, and don't worry too much about this right now. We'll probably not even use SQL Alchemy, um, but this is an easy example, um, just getting your feet wet with uh, databases as well. So these two lines are for database initialization. Um, cool. And then um, I will skip... Um, Actually, yeah, let's go into this. So then we have to, when we're creating a database, just very quickly, we need to create a database model, uh, especially without SQL Alchemy. And this is kind of, the model is like, model or you can say schema is kind of like the um, values that you're storing in the database. Um, and if you're creating a table, think of it like a table. This is a um, relational database, which you may or may not be using, uh, but, you may be using a new SQL database, for example, um, but in uh, relational databases, you can think of it as a table um, and uh, uh, entries are stored in rows. Uh, so each row is kind of a data point, you could say like a, or an entry and the columns are different uh, values that you store for each entry. Um, so for example, for each entry, for each video, we store an ID, so the name, so the views and for the likes, as you can see. Uh, and these have a different uh, data types. You know, obviously the ID is an integer. Obviously, the string is, uh, or the name is a string, and, and so on. Uh, also, you'll notice that we have primary key equals true for the ID. Uh, this is because the fact that when we have a data um, uh, database, uh, the primary key is the unique identifier of the particular uh, data value. So when you have this, you cannot have a, the same ID for multiple values. It's kind of used to identify quickly. You know, pull out a a um, data value about that. Um, cool. And then, so we just define these here, uh, and then we have this representation um, or kind of uh, method. This is essentially a uh, way to that will print out the representation of a particular. Um, uh, data point or data or kind of row, if you will. So I'll print out the name, views, likes, um, and we're using kind of format string to do this. Uh, and it's yeah, it's it's it won't be printed out every time, but um, it's useful just to to see kind of what uh, what representations are in the database. Cool. Um, Cool, and then we run uh, db.createAll. Uh, actually, let me just delete. Uh, let me just comment this out because we don't. We only want to run this once, um, and this will just create the database. Um, so, whatever it's from the database, you've run this multiple times. It'll just remove all of it. So, you want to um, only have that once. And note, this database is this DB file, which obviously you can't read because you know it's just a. Uh, 
it's not human readable, but um, all your databases will be stored there. Cool. Um, and again, this is kind of the location. So this is just taking your uh, current directory and just appending kind of whatever. So this database is just in the current directory. So that's why it's just uh, .db. Uh, the database of db files here. Cool. Um, the next thing is uh, request arguments. Um, so these are arguments that you can add uh, when you're making a request. So when you're putting or updating um, values, for example, we have put an update request, you can make these required, maybe not make these required. Um, and these are the kind of things that you specify uh, here. So, so these would be kind of the uh, representations that you specify here. Uh, and then these are parsed using this request parser. So all the data that you put in this maybe JSON format that you're appending to your request will then be parsed um, using this parser and only with only for these attributes that are mentioned here or the arguments that are mentioned here will be parsed and it can be used in your actual requests. Cool. So I'll skip this resource field um, and we'll go into now the, the meat of it, which is the actual resource and how it's defined. So we inherit uh, video is our uh, resource class we inherit from resource. Um, and then we have all of our API calls. So specifically, we have the get, uh, put, and patch. Uh, and remember, we called patch here previously. So let's just start off with the get. So get will again get data. Um, so when we're going to get, we only really care about the ID because we just want to get all the data that's uh, returned from the ID. So we will um, simply once we have the ID, we just passed in, which is uh, which is parsed, uh, or actually no, this is not parsed. It's uh, directly from here. So this is the ID. So it directly comes in because that's how we've created the uh, our resources, the int. So we get the ID um, every time, as you can see. That's the kind of value that we take in. And you can have multiple of these values. Like it doesn't just have to end here with ID. You could have many other values and they would just be kind of delimited like this you just add another value uh, cool. um, yeah so we just want to get data so we go to our model right so there's a model our database model um, and we query so we're getting data so we need to query data and we filter by we call the filter by method to filter by so we're only getting uh, the specific rows in this case that have the video ID uh, as the ID, which is again only one because this, the ID is the primary key, uh, and we get first um, to get the actual data. Um, and then, if not result, is this a quick way of checking if the result is null um, or none in this case, and because this is Python, and if it's none, we abort again with this 404 message. This is again kind of going into this property of having consistent messaging, and we see we could not find a video with that ID. Uh, and we just, otherwise we'll, we'll uh, return the um, uh, result. And again, abort comes from this RESTful API, uh, which we've imported. Okay. Um, okay, and then don't worry too much about Marshall with yet. Uh, we'll go into that again. Um, next we have the put, which again, now we actually need these arguments. So now we actually need these because if you put putting data, we need the name, the views, the likes, so that we can actually update the database. So what we do is we parse the args. So now args will contain a dictionary of uh, with names, views, and likes that we can actually, oh, sorry, we're up here. Uh, with names, views, and likes that we can actually use, um, and we can index them just like a dictionary. This is a dictionary. Uh, so let me take a uh, result, and we now want to again query, but instead of just like uh, returning this data, we now want to modify it. So we query for the result again, the exact same way. You'll notice this line is exactly the same as up here. Um, and we're going to check if it's null. If it is, then you know the video ID is taken. So this message is slightly different because it's not that we can find the ID so we can uh, return the data corresponding to it. It's that this data um, already exists. So this is the opposite case, right? So if um, if an ID exists, uh, so if a uh, 
result corresponding to id exists of data corresponding to id exists we cannot you know create a new resource right so we just abort uh, and this is again why put uh, is different because this will have a standard result every time you'll only be able to create a resource if it doesn't already exist um, so this is why it's slightly different than, than um, um, post okay um, next we have we uh, create a video model object so this is kind of how we now add to the database however um, the ID is the same you'll know that we have so this is the same ID but now we need to modify the data right so again arg is again a dictionary so we can simply just set all of these variables or all of these arguments and so name views likes that we store in the database but with these new values that have been passed in and we just index into the database uh, index into or not index but um, get the value from the dictionary then we need to add this is kind of the two steps to add uh, or, uh, to a database we need to call the add me method in, in a session so db.session the add again the db is this db the, the alchemy db um, so we add and then we add this object and then we need to commit the object so committing the object uh, is kind of the final steps. So you add like temporarily. Uh, it's kind of a you know, soft add, if if you will, and then we need to actually commit the, commit the change. Cool. And then we return video, um, which is the model that we you know pushed in, and we return 201 because it is it is a uh, success message, uh, and, and we're, we're done. Cool. And finally, we have patch, uh, which is very similar. Um, so again, you have args, uh, result, everything is the same. Again, how about the, the, this flip? So now, we, patch will only allow you to change something, change a resource that already exists. So if the video does not exist, so if if, if result is none, so there's no this query query filter by doesn't return anything. So the video doesn't exist. We return a 404 again, being consistent, um, and we then check now if uh, arg specified a value. So that's why we have different um, arguments here, right? So for video, we have, you see the arguments are re required true. So when we're creating a new resource, we have to have all of the requirements, requirements specified because otherwise we can't store them in the database. Right? This database is uh, structured, right? So because it's structured, that means you have to store all the values. Um, so one of these values cannot be missing. However, if we're updating, so in these in these uh, in these arguments, we're updating. So it doesn't have to be that we specify all the arguments. Say we only want to update the name, but not the views and the likes, or just the views and the likes, but not the name. Uh, we only need to specify some of these. So that's why we make this. We don't set required to true as you do here. So you won't see that here. Um, so we don't know now which of these has been specified. So this is kind of a um, not the best way to, to, to do this check, but we need to check now which of these have actually been specified by the user in the request. So we again use uh, use the same kind of uh, Python kind of syntax where if a value of a variable is none, it just will return false, right? So if basically if this exists, so if this is not none, so if args name is not none, uh, so it's been specified by the user, we just change the name in, in the um, result, it's a result a name again. This is just a this is just a um, this is a class. We can directly just get the class variables. Um, so name uh, args name, and we just keep doing this. So we may change all three of them, two of them, one of them, etc. It's um, yeah, we we need not change all of them again, and then we just again commit to the database. Um, so uh, and we don't and we don't need to call add here because we're not adding a new resource. Right? We're not adding a new row into this database. We're simply changing the values. So we only need to commit because we've changed these now. Now we need to actually like we've changed um, the values in uh, the object that we have uh, that we have been given by query filter. And now we need to commit these changes back, uh, and then we return the result again. 
Uh, and that's kind of the output you see here. This is the output um, of the new changes that have been uh, uh, changed, or the new valid value in the database. Cool. Uh, now I'll just quickly, that's basically the meat of it, um, of what we're doing here. Um, however, I'll go into this Marshall with. So Marshall with, again, we imported it here. Uh, basically, uh, one thing is that when you, uh, when we created these objects, um, these instances, right, there are, there are objects, right? So they need to be serialized such that we can actually, you know, get good values from them. Think of this is like a, a two string statement, essentially in, in, in some ways, um, in Java that you have, or like something like that. So these are like a way to get the information into, of an object into a readable format that we can then show to the user. Um, so Marshall with essentially is a serializer. Um, and essentially all we need to do when we use Marshall with is declare a dictionary, uh, a dictionary like this, which is a template. Uh, what we need to return in fields that we use here is uh, imported here. So all the things that we need to um, uh, return from an object, uh, we just declare it like this. So then we just add this tag here. So Marshall with, and then again, okay, resource fields, which is here uh, at the top of each of these methods. So when they return values that are objects of this type, um, these objects will be first uh, serialized into this format before being returned. And that is exactly why we have this format here. Again, ID, name, views, likes. So for example, if I change this to V here, um, and I think that updated. Yeah, we see that view has been capitalized. So yeah, so this is this, the, this serialization uh, template. Cool, um, and that's essentially all of it. Again, this is actually a quick line I didn't mention, but you, this is again in just any kind of Python code and uh, Flask code. Uh, main method, you just need to run the app. Uh, and we're running in debug mode, so debug is through. Uh, and again, that kind of gives you the nice features of being able to uh, upload again and again, uh, or uh, sorry, update again and again the uh, code. As we saw here, it just keeps updating. Uh, this uh, detected change and then we get updates so we don't have to keep restarting the server again and again cool so we can just uh try this out a little bit more um so for example uh this is patch let's just do uh change gym so everything else is the same so again we had views were zero uh likes were 101 um yeah, I think I changed that. So we're going to have name uh, be Matt. I'm just going to change that. Uh, I'm going to run this again. So you can see um, name Matt views 9000. For some reason, this something happened here with serialization. Um, anyway, that's probably not important. But uh, we see in this case that um, the name changes to math because this is a patch, so we're just changing one of the values. Cool. Um, let's try a put. So we say put, and then just type math. Um, we get a message. Um, let's see why this is not giving us a. Um, hmm, that's odd. This should be giving us. Oh, I may be creating the. Nope, that's good. Oh, I think, yeah, this is just uh, giving us the message um, of the things that we need to add. Um, yeah, so we haven't, so this string is coming from just the fact that we have these help strings here. Uh, so it, it won't give us the error, but, um, say views 2000, um, and, 
So let's again. So this helps things kind of helpful. Because if we do that, then we need to put likes. So we kind of know with the API. Uh, we have very clear messages from the API again. Um, okay, and uh, let's do two. And we get video ideas taken. Right? It's because this is two, and we already had the, the one with two. That's the one that we were modifying here. Um, cool, so let's do this as three now. And we see that it is successful, and we, we get three. So now if we call a uh, get request, uh, we just. Uh, Get three, and we don't really need any of this now. And we see that we get the, the third um, row again. So this has been changed. We get the output from the put, and then we call get, and we get the same response. So the database has been updated. Um, cool. So I think this is most of what you would need to get started with Flask um, and get started with with APIs, databases. Uh, again, databases are not really part of this lecture uh, and part of this uh, discussion and workshop, but this is just a brief introduction. We'll go much more into them and, and maybe we'll even modify this example to include uh, GCP um, instead of SQL Alchemy uh, and actually store stuff remotely and pull it in instead of just storing the database file locally. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that was helpful. And um, I look forward to seeing you at the workshop in person. Thank you.